All right. Uh, as they say, they've kept the best for the last, <laughs> the grand finale. I actually uh, did react a bit about the, unfortunately, <laughs> we have to go to the next panel. But um, I'm actually personally very grateful to both uh, the Hong Kong University and to the Consul General of France to have uh, taken the initiative to organize this uh, anniversary and to understand how important the financial sector and the banking sector are in order to achieve the targets that the world put for itself uh, five years ago. So my name is Karen Hearn. Beside being a, a French trade advisor, uh, vice chair of the Swedish Chamber of Commerce and a director of the European Chamber of Commerce, in my free time, I also work as an investor uh, and I co-founded a company with one of the largest investors in the fourth largest CO2 emitter in the world, it's Russia. And I can tell you that it is investors and the financial sector that are moving things there because we have a government which is less ambitious than other places around the world. We're not here to talk about Russia, but I just wanted to comment the fact that I personally, I, I basically on a daily basis, consider these this very important uh, issues and challenges that we have at stake. So why is green finance and why is finance extremely relevant to the topic? We have heard already five years ago and nowadays an increasing number of governments and countries around the world setting very ambitious targets in terms of CO2 reduction. These targets cannot be achieved without one commodity that each and every company in the world needs, i.e. money. Even though we have heard, for instance, from, uh, uh, from the head of the European office, uh, Mr. Gnocchi, how, for instance, how big the uh, European uh, uh, stimulus is uh, to, to help Europe out of, of COVID, it is actually uh, very little compared to what is needed to help, again, uh, reach these targets we have in terms of, of climate change. It's very difficult to know exactly how much is needed but there are estimates saying that cumulative between 100 and 150 trillion dollars will be needed. Just to the math, very briefly, we already, uh, already one third of the time before 2030, for instance, agenda, we're talking about amounts like three to five trillion dollars a year. That's twice the GDP of France. That's 10 times the GDP of Hong Kong. Even though we have governments who are very generous and very willing to pay their part, clearly, I can tell you, it's not going to be enough. So we do need to mobilize as well the financial sector. Before we go on this panel, I would just like to, uh, on with this discussion, just please put on the screen a couple of uh, interesting numbers to show you uh, what is the situation like today. On the upper uh, graph to the left, you see the amount of uh, green bonds and sust sustainability and social bonds. Today we will be, of course, focusing mainly on climate finance, so we're talking more about green bonds. Clearly, a huge increase in terms of, uh, in terms of issuance, and the one I actually prefer is the one which is here at, uh, below as percentage as part of the total bond issuance. In 2015, when Paris Agreement was signed, it was only 1.6% of the bonds in the world which were green bonds. Five, five years later, an amazing number of already 15%. That is very, very impressive indeed. On the upper side, you have a right side, sorry, you have the issuer's nationality. Uh, China is a huge issuer, so it makes it very relevant to be here uh, discussing, of course, about the, uh, the solutions and, uh, and the other countries here as well. Uh, Meaningful uh, to say that France as well is a very uh, uh, important country in terms of, uh, of green issuance. Other key figures uh, worth mentioning here. Uh, in my world, for instance, as an investment and asset manager, the so-called ESG funds this year, right now, have reached $1.2 trillion. And uh, the largest part of that comes actually from Europe. It's, it's $1 trillion. Uh, and if you look at for the third quarter of 2020, in terms of number, we had $80 billion uh, of inflows into ESG funds, $70 billion of bond issuance. It's the highest recorded in any third quarter period ever. 
and no less than 314 deals from 191 bond individual insurers. So a lot of activity, clearly, and that's good to see. So uh, on this note, let's start this exciting panel. I'm delighted to have representative from the banking industry, representative from the green finance uh, and covering other kind of financial services providers, and, and personalities uh, in front of you uh, will have a lot to say on this topic. So I'm going to start by asking each and every one very briefly not to tell uh, who you are, because we know who you are, because people would have read the, uh, the list ahead of this presentation, but just to tell me, in, in short words, what does green finance represent to you? And thinking about five years ago, wherever you were, and thinking about today, what is the most striking to you that has happened during these five years? I start with you, Johannes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's all. Uh, well, five years ago, I was actually in charge of doing renewable energy financing for my bank in Germany. Uh, we come from a cooperative background, so we have a strong, we have a strong interest in, in green finance. And obviously, as Germans, uh, we were very early movers. We started with the Green Party already in the 80s, so uh, we have a long tradition. Five years ago, when we were doing green financing, we thought we were doing good because clearly it was green and that was good. But honestly, also, we were subsidizing a lot of things that were not very cleverly managed. We've spoken previously already about feed-in tariffs. Um, feed-in tariffs in Germany at the time, they were not so well designed, so there was a lot of subsidy that effectively went into nowhere. Some people were getting very rich and other people were paying a high price for that. So a good cause but not perfectly executed. And I think this is where five years later today and going forward, we need to pay attention that we design the systems so that it is not a general green is good, but that we actually achieve the maximum of utility from the money we spend. Thank you. So talking about green, of course, Tracy, congratulations on this beautiful dress you have today. You. Tell us more. Sure. Thanks, Corinne. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. And good uh, morning to the one darling from Europe. Um, honored to be here today uh, sharing the stage with heavy-weighted uh, speakers uh, to celebrate the fifth anniversary of the Paris Agreement. And special thank to the Councillor General of, of the France and uh, for inviting me and for HKUST for hosting this such important event. Coming back to your questions, um, what does green finance represent to me and um, how it has it been transformed over the past five years? So green finance to me is a chance for our children's future and a chance for us to achieve the Paris Agreement of keeping the uh, temperature uh, of below 1.5 degree. From what I see in this region, especially in Hong Kong, um, I don't have to look back five years. I think a lot of significant progress has been made in the past two years. And uh, it has evolved from green to GSS um, on the slide, uh, green and social and sustainability to sustainability link to now transitions finance. I will talk more about what this means uh, later on. And the most striking things um, that happen, of course, to me is the Hong Kong SAR chief executive policy address of Hong Kong um, target net zero by 2050 and also the China target by uh, uh, carbon neutrality by 2060. Thank you, Tracy. So take over to uh, Hugo representing BNP Paribas. First of all, maybe the striking things, um, uh, I must say, it has to be the uh, Paris Agreement signing uh, back in 2015. Not because today is the 50th uh, year anniversary, but definitely this is the most remarkable event and the setting of the SDG goals. Uh, because imagine you are aligning uh, over 100 countries to have a common framework. Obviously, each country will have their own destination or work path how to achieve the goal, but under the same framework. Uh, and also the SDG goals is to get the goals to set for humanity, uh, set for the planet. So I think this is definitely very meaningful and it's for me, for myself and for my company, definitely is one of the most striking things. Um, and in terms of uh, what does it mean for uh, uh, sustainability to uh, BNP Paribas, I think we believe sustainable finance uh, is a fundamental approach 
uh, to how we conduct our banking business. Uh, one important point is we engage with our stakeholders to put sustainable finance into our business instead of putting business into sustainable finance. So we have to embed it into our DNA, doing day-to-day -day business, uh, not by simply uh, putting in place a sustainable department and try to achieve everything inside. So it has to be within the DNA of a business. Thank you. All right, Alicia, now, uh, you've been quiet for a while. So I know Alicia, Alicia very well, she's never quiet. So now I will let her speak. And Alicia, you are both here as representative of Natexis, a very important uh, banking institution from Europe and also a professor at uh, HKUST. Uh, you will choose uh, to uh, take your comments on, on behalf of, of the institution you choose to represent today, sure. obviously. Sure, thank you. Well, this is just a personal uh, experience, as you told us we should do. So five years ago, I actually joined a think tank in Europe called Brugel, neither of the two. And that was my first experience with green finance. Just to come up with this idea in a very you know, old paper that now I reread while we were waiting for this, and, and I was, wow. At that time, we thought, how are we going to link green finance with climate change, which seems like a logical thing to, to think. But actually, for, for a long time, it was hard to link the two because it was so hard to have enough projects in a way that would really look fully green. And we didn't have even a good listing, which is what the European Commission has been doing lately. And when I moved you know, five years later to, to what we've been doing in the bank, um, I was astonished to see this small investment bank coming up with a green weight factor before the, even the European Central Bank even thought about it. it. This is basically where we are heading. Yeah, we're th heading to a world where banks will pay more capital if they are less green. And the question is, how do you calculate that? So it's not only about green finance, you know, bond issuance, it's about your own balance sheet and how that might affect the cost of capital in the future. So I thought that was quite interesting because that links green finance to climate change directly through your lending and what the supervisor may actually tell you the cost of capital might be because of that. So it's a very different angle than just bond issuance. And it, I found it very interesting. Thank you. Michelle, Credit Agricole, obviously a very heavy weight in terms of green bond issuance, and I know you will tell us a bit more about it today. But again, a more personal touch. What was, uh, do you remember what you did five years ago and uh, what has been the most striking during these five years to you as a well, professional? Well, Karen, since I am uh, French, I'm a bit indisciplined, so I will not go five years before. I will go 10 years before, if you allow me. Uh, 10 years ago, it's about the time, it was 2009 actually, that Credit Agricole uh, set up its uh, sustainable banking team in Paris. At that time, believe me, there were not many people, even within the bank, who thought that it was uh, a smart and a good idea. Uh, we, were, uh, we were alone uh, to do that, and uh, the few people who started that uh, really started an adventure, and nobody believed at the time that it would bring us uh, where we are today. Uh, to answer your question, uh, I think two, in two words. First, scale. Uh, five years ago, you have the numbers here, 35 billion, it's going to be 385 or 390 for the full year 2020, multiplied by 10. If we look at the same numbers for Asia now, uh, we went from 4 billion in 2015 to probably around 38, 39 billion this year. Uh, so it's even more. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's really a tremendous uh, progression. And that was really during the last five years that it did take off. As you can see, really uh, very click clearly here from 2010 to 2015. Okay, it was the beginning, but it was still the uh, pioneering time. So it's really... Uh, a strong takeoff of green finance over the last uh, five years. Um, and uh, Tracy was mentioning the uh, other products, the other type of financing beyond the bonds, the loan, uh, green loans, five years ago, they were not existing. Uh, green loans today, it's going to be more than $100 billion uh, dollar, uh, in 2020. And the, the second uh, important development I see over the last five years is that 
all major international financial institutions, banks, but also, as you said rightly, investors, so asset managers, insurers, we all have designed and came up with uh, climate policies, climate strategies. And believe me, it's, it's not uh, a marketing gimmick. It's really a framework we are imposing on ourselves, which is a very uh, constraining framework, but which we are following very closely. And that, I think, uh, a major development that happened uh, in the last uh, three, four years. Mm, indeed. Okay, thank you. Well, thanks a lot. So now we know what happened during these five years, but you know, we're not here to speak about the past. We're here to speak about today and tomorrow. Uh, so I've asked each of my panelists to, to, to share with us what they thought were the most important, um, actually, developments in terms of, of realities of green finance today to start with. And I'm saying today, I don't mean specifically on the 12th of December. I'm talking 2020, 2021. For instance, for investors like, like, like ourselves, uh, the big thing which is happening in Europe is the, the, the number of regulations, is the introduction of the EU green taxonomy, is the introduction of the NFRD. I always have to remember these letters. I'm still not there yet. The non-financial reporting directive that was introduced already two years ago. That means that all companies in Europe with more than 500 staff need to report according to specific guidelines, which are also encompassing climate, uh, climate and environment. And for us as fund managers, we have to look forward to something called the SFDR, the Sustainable Finance Disclosure, Disclosure Regulation, will be introduced on 10th of March 2021, which means that we, as well as providers of, of, of mutual funds and, and financial products, would also have to explain exactly uh, what we mean when we are talking about, for instance, green funds and things like that. So that's very important. But uh, enough said about, uh, about Europe and myself. Uh, I want to hear now from Tracy about uh, the reality of green finance today in Hong Kong, obviously. Yeah, sure. So for that, I think I'll go back to um, how I described the green finance, uh, green finance has evolved from the past, right? From green, which is financing environmental benefit, to GSS, the green social and sustainability, which is a mix of the green and social, to sustainability link, which is um, a KPI-linked product tied to actual performance of the company and um, or project. For example, ESG ratings or improvement in energy efficiency that we talked about earlier, to now the hottest topic of transition finance. So the idea of transition finance is to help non-green sector, which is traditionally will not qualify for green financing, to move towards net zero, which is very important for the topic today. For example, in June this year, CLP, one of Hong Kong's coal-fired power plants, has raised 350 million US dollar to fund uh, a better energy mix uh, in order to produce cleaner form of energy. This is the second energy transition bond day issue. And in terms of market developments, going back to uh, the graph uh, on, on, on the screen from Corinne, showing earlier that um, the whole green and sustainable finance market today is still dominant by bonds. Um, last I looked, was still over 70%, and, and, and it's driven by the GSS, GSS market. And we do see a strong long growth, like Michelle mentioned, uh, that picked up recently, but therefore really large ticket items, um, large corporate. So my point here is that the current green and sustainable finance market um, still um, not addressing on the smaller corporate SME or retail sector that is largely still untapped. So in order to achieve the goal of the Paris Agreement, it is very important that we, we, we extend the green and sustainable finance to push down the capital structure to cover all these important sectors. To that end, at the Hong Kong Green Finance Association, um, let me share a couple of projects uh, that we're working on in developing in the retail and SME sector. Um, under the green building projects, we are working with the retail shops and restaurants, developing um, the right green financing tool to help them to retrofit, to make their shop and restaurant chains that are more energy efficient. Also, we are working with um, technology firms leveraging blockchain technology and environmental consultants to develop suitable finance product uh, to allow SME to have better access to um, the green and sustainable finance. So very busy. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Great. Johannes, you want to take the, uh, the next... Uh, you were, when we were uh, discussing ahead of this uh, 
panel, you were telling me about uh, a very important issue in this uh, topic of green finance, which is the importance of actually measuring and assessing what is green and not really green, because we have a big risk called green washing, uh, or sometimes even rainbow washing for the SDGs, and it's, it's extremely important to tackle it in the right way. So can you ch share with us more of your thoughts regarding this? I'd love to. So greenwashing, clearly. The, the, green is a good idea. We all agree. And so where there are good ideas, sometimes people take good ideas to make use of them individually for other purposes. So greenwashing, effectively, you're a company or you're an investor, you're saying, this is green, this is good, and so please finance, when in effect, of course, it may not be. I think what is important about that is that it is very difficult for people individually to understand what is actually good in green. And we are speaking a lot about bonds, we're speaking about a lot of, of big programs, but I think it's important to remember, and you've pointed that out, a lot of this took off from investor pushing, NGOs pushing, saying, look, we want our funds to be invested in good projects, in green projects. This is as important as the, as the bond issuance is. And so people need to understand what exactly is good in green, we have to tell them, and I think you've also mentioned that where the EU of its taxonomy is trying for the first time to say, okay, this is a good project, this is what it contributes. And I think that is very important for people individually to be able to gauge their investment. In normal bond ratings, you have S&P, you have Moody's, you have a couple others, very simple. Everyone understands triple A is triple A. In green bonds, not that simple. In green investments, not that simple. Is this a good investment? Is this maybe not such a good investment? For this really to take off, we need, again, the people to engage at grassroots level. They need to say, my savings go here, because that is a good investment. That will bring us forward. Thank you. Uh, now we go over to Ugo, and uh, Ugo, you were, uh, you've been specifically focusing a lot about your clients when we were preparing this panel. What, tell us a bit more about how you see this, how you engage with them, how you make sure that they are on the same boat. Sure. I think um, in terms of the present days uh, for us, uh, in terms of uh, sustainable finance, there are three levels uh, or three categories that, that, that you mentioned, one of which is engagement with clients. Uh, the other is about developing the risk assessment or risk management process. Uh, and then the, the also the engagement with regulators as well. I think that the, all these three parts are, are, are core. In terms of clients that uh, uh, we do engage our clients uh, with, on their sustainable journey, uh, regardless of the sector uh, and geography, um, I think uh, it's clear that we have to um, uh, develop uh, investment product or financing products that into their needs. Uh, one key uh, area is about transition. Uh, because uh, it's important uh, that we remember that climate risk is not only about um, negative exclusion. Uh, it's not only about constraint. Um, uh, we also need to look at the uh, sectors that must make uh, a necessary transition uh, so that we could support our clients in that journey. Uh, I think that is also important. And, and the third thing about client is also about disclosure. Uh, we need to help our clients to make necessary disclosure to track their progress and their commitment uh, on 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 on, uh, um, uh, on the green green journey. In terms of risk management, I think uh, we are also quite um, active in terms of looking at a green, uh, um, a developing methodology. Uh, uh, and so we have joint forces like, uh, for example, the science-based uh, ta target initiatives, what we call the SBTI. Uh, so BNP Paribas is part of that uh, to develop that methodology. Uh, we also signed the Cato Wise commitment, uh, I think, uh, two years ago. Uh, and and uh, on that, we have developed a methodology as well called the Paris Agreement Capital Transition Assessment. So uh, that is, uh, uh, we cover the, uh, the assessment on automakers, oil and gas sector, uh, as well as other heavy industries, uh, so that uh, we have, uh, um, uh, we open source kind of methodology that people can or other banks can also um, uh, take part and 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 and, and join force uh, and also uh, last year we we uh, signed the poseidon 
agreements as well. So on that, uh, which promote the decarbonization of the shipping industry. Uh, 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 so that's it's on the risk as management side. Obviously, from a, from a regulator standpoint, uh, in APAC, uh, we've been talking to the MAS, uh, also uh, looking into the first what we call this first sustainable supply chain program. So we are also studying that feasibility and development for them. For Hong Kong, we are working closely with various regulators, including Hong Kong MA, SFC. Uh, you know that they are also very active in terms of trying to bring in the taxonomy in place uh, and also how to develop a, a necessary risk fr management framework. So we are very active on that part as well. And on China, obviously, on the Belt and Road initi Initiative, they have also their sustainable uh, uh, agreement uh, on that. And BMP Paribas also signed the agreement on that. OK, thank you. You did mention Belt and Road Initiative. So it's a perfect, perfect transition to uh, Alicia, because when we discuss uh, ahead of this panel, Alicia, you were telling me that uh, you've been doing some work on this. And you also, as an economist, uh, spending a lot of time analyzing uh, monetary policies around the world. So we look forward to hearing your comments on what you see here as a reality for green finance on this specific space, maybe also public spending, international project, and so forth. Sure. Well, I'll start with the monetary policy, just to follow a little bit the European wave, and then I'll go back to Vera. I think, um, frankly speaking, as a European, it's, it's tough nowadays. Yeah, it's like we look very small, very. But when it comes to green, it's like, oh my God! I mean, sometimes I'm even like it's actually bolder than I thought it would ever be for an aging society. You know, it's like it's it's like wow. I mean. First of all, because it's costly. And I give, let me give you the example of monetary policy or even supervision. Once upon a time, I worked at the European Central Bank, and I found it was so conservative. But there was this objective out there that nobody could even look at, which is like, first, price stability, price stability, price stability. Well, we took it from somewhere, you know, in, in the Buddhist bank. And, and, but somebody, somebody somehow, thought, why not write something like secondary? Of course, once you comply with uh, price stability. And there's something like, so wonderful, actually, because it even mentions the environment. <laughs> it's like it goes all the way to, and, and there it is. And it means a lot for Europe, because it means that monetary policy, and we are going to have this before anybody else, I have to say. I think Madame Lagarde is pushing. We'll have a review of the monetary policy strategy of the ECB, which will include, for sure, we don't know how, but there's two ways, asset purchases. So, you know, a kind of a, a green, you know, a, 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 like a, you know, green. green versus yellow versus brown, as many in many other instances, or haircuts. But it's going to be there. And the thing is, as we have had other, we have basically developed other standards, Developing standards for monetary policy is quite something. And, and the very same theme for banking supervision, as I mentioned. So we have this capital adequacy, so internal capital adequacy standards for green, which go well beyond a single bank, you know, independently or voluntarily doing this. Yeah, it means that banks will be penalized if they don't lend green. And that's a totally different ballgame because, because there, the taxonomy will be used <laughs> fully. <laughs> you know, it, 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 I think that is a totally different ball game. And for me, the question then is, and it brings me to the VRI very, very quickly, is Europe is small. So we're talking we about the Belt and Road this. Initiative. Not everybody yes, always yes. understands. But yes, uh, yeah. what I mean to say is that we can do all of this, but we're not even the fourth largest emitter, as you rightly point out. There's much smaller economies out there that emit more than Europe. And you know the numbers are well known. Yeah, China twenty eight, US fifteen. <laughs> then you have India. Then you have Russia. And then finally, a block that is as big in GDP as China or the US. So we can do what we like, but we're not going to solve the problem by ourselves. Yes. So the thing we can do is to export these standards. So this brings me to the BRI. Of course, it's already there. We already have this. Uh, you know, these wonderful kind of ideas of, of, of ta again, a taxonomy. But the point is, it has to be more made compulsory. 
So I think that's where the Europeans can bring the standards to, to find the ways to have kind of co-responsibility for, for those projects. Because without that, I frankly think it's going to be very difficult because the incentives aren't there. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yes, so we are definitely uh, happy in Europe to take this role of being an exporter of uh, green finance solutions, especially your bank, uh, among other institutions. Uh, tell us a bit more about, uh, about your view on that. Okay, uh, before answering your question, and, and because we are in Hong Kong and we had the honor to have the presence of the uh, Secretary for the Environment, I'd like to mention that uh, uh, the uh, the first conventional green bond issue in Asia ever was done actually by uh, the Hong Kong SAR. Uh, 2019, the yeah. Uh, it was in June or May 19, I don't recall, I think May 19. Uh, so to some extent, Hong Kong has been a pioneer and uh, uh, we have no Singaporean in the room, but uh, the MIS is still discussing a lot about it. But in Hong Kong, they did it. So I think it was worth to be, uh, to be mentioned. Um, we delivered at the beginning perhaps the good news. Uh, now the bad news. Uh, indeed, all these numbers are very impressive. But when you look at the needs, at the financing needs, they are unfortunately still very Too marginal. Uh, so there is a number I always like to quote. This is a, a figure which is a, a bit outdated, but still uh, valid today. It's uh, the OECD estimation of uh, the financing needs, the investment needs uh, to uh, reach uh, the uh, goal of the uh, COP21. And by 2030, uh, the amount to be mobilized is 90, 95 trillion US dollar. So you see, 90, which is about 7 trillion per year because this started in 2015. So 7 trillion per year, you see here, 0.4 maybe uh, trillion for the green bonds. So indeed, bonds and loans are not the only way uh, to finance uh, those investments. You have government budget, you have plenty of other things. But it, it, it tells that what uh, is in front of us is really massive. And uh, to uh, connect with what uh, Alicia was saying, uh, banks and the financial sector are not going to make it alone on the financing side. They clearly need uh, more involvement uh, from the government and uh, indeed taxonomy is a, is a very important element uh, in this respect. Uh, a comment as well if you allow me and, and sharing a bit of our experience uh, on the uh, governance uh, banks have adopted to manage that and to address uh, the uh, greenwashing uh, accusation that we are from time to time uh, uh, we are on the front page and, and we have NGOs who are looking at every single thing we do and we finance and, and we need them because uh, in, in, to be successful we need a check and balance in the system and, and they provide that. Uh, if we look at it, uh, the uh, controversial projects are representing a very small part of uh, what is being financed through green bonds or social and sustainability bills. So the problem exist, uh, but the problem is not that uh, that large. And from a government perspective and, and sharing our own uh, Credit Agricole experience, when we started this adventure in 2009, as I said, uh, we ensured that our sustainable banking team was not part of a business line. Uh, so to be more specific, was not part of our debt capital market teams. Because indeed, when you are a business line, your primary goal is to reach your budget and to make money. So you may be tempted from time to time uh, to take uh, shortcuts and, and to uh, lean towards uh, greenwashing. So we made sure our sustainable team was truly independent and would be in a position uh, to tell the business line, no, uh, we will not give you the green light that's uh, the word, uh, to do this transaction because that could be uh, disputed and not being totally uh, green. Very interesting. All right, well, time is, go is running, uh, not only for the panel, but also for the world. Uh, two, uh, five years ago, uh, 2015, we uh, set goals for 15 years ahead, 2030. So two third time left. So I've asked my uh, distinguished panelists to focus the last for the last part of this discussion about 
what is needed, what do we see happening in the coming years for this, you know, the, the whole idea of climate finance to be actually a success and enabling this uh, transition. And I know it's Christmas soon, but I really ask them to be quite objective and not just tell us about wishes, but really concrete measures or recommendations or, or well, you could still say wishes, but, you know, wishes that could happen. So uh, we don't want to start. Hugo, can I start with you? Well, it's not wishes. It will happen. And, um, and actually, in the press today, uh, or not today, this week, economists say coal is extending and uh, it's, it's happening. Uh, for my opinion, for, for what needed or what we have to have uh, uh, to implement going forward is, is more emergence of consensus, uh, definition of green, what is green, what is not green, uh, alignment of taxonomy, um, so hence the aligning uh, the capital contribution uh, and also the demonstration of impact measurements. I think that is very important and is needed for, for, for the future growth, uh, the journey of, 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 of green finance. Uh, but that has to be backed by science. Um, and unification of a global carbon price is something that uh, we desperately needed. Uh, so price on carbon uh, is, has to be fungible, uh, uh, and, and that hence will increase substantially uh, the investor confidence. So this is what I think is most important. Mm, thank you. Alicia, I would like to ask you to, to uh, comment now because um, I think it's um, yes. a so, number of issues that you've also discussed with me about that. Yes. So first of all, I, I agree. I think... Um, when you have uh, something which has so huge externalities as climate, if you don't have a global price, how can you even solve the problem? It's, I mean, for an economist, it's like we're trying to do something impossible, mission yeah. impossible. So first of all, we need that. Second, we need to make it transferable. So this brings us to the very hot topic of the of the of the uh, of the carbon. Uh, adjustment transfer and transfer adjustment tax and that is something that you know not everybody likes but i think we need that and how this uh, how this comes to finance well once you have that you can actually have a market you know and, and, and which we never managed to to build i think that these are the steps beyond that what we discuss and i want to forget that is this idea of green certificates so we did publish a little piece at Bruegel on this, and I think it's quite interesting. It's, it's really about moving away from kind of a project-based green bond to a certificate that uh, proves your greenness. And that why is this better, in our opinion? Because it separates liquidity issues, which sometimes you know distort the pricing, to credit issues, to green issues. And, and therefore, you, you can have a, a more liquid market because it's all bonds, no matter whether green, red, yellow, or blue. But then you have your certificates. And, and I think that's, that's something that could be explored. And finally, the idea of this is not about projects. It brings me to your SMEs, <laughs> Tracy. It's about policies. I mean, what do you do? Not what do you build? Because it's not all about building something or engaging in a project. So I think if we, if our taxonomy basically has to go beyond. It has to go all about activities, policies. Uh, then we could involve um, sectors, whole sectors, not necessarily big companies. So I think there's a long way to go. But I guess, you know, it's a... We have up to 2050, I guess. So, yeah. I mean, again, big challenge, but uh, there's a lot at stake and uh, there's a lot of energy as well. And, and, and maybe for once, a, a, an alignment between uh, actors from the, the private sector and, and the banking business, for instance, market and public authorities, uh, which really is a, well, is a good thing. Michel, tell us more about what you think need to happen uh, for... Um, for the Paris Agreement goals to be to be met and 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 uh, considering what the finance sector has to do. Well, as I said earlier, and, and sorry for repeating myself, the, the the finance sector and the banking sector cannot do it alone. 
And I think that's very important to understand. All the more we are, we are working, we are living in a competitive world. So it's not only about European banks, but it's also about Chinese banks, about US banks. And if there are too many uh, discrepancies between the way the regulators are approaching this matter, then this is creating a non-competitive uh, battlefield and it can ruin the whole, uh, the whole uh, adventure. So I think that is very important to me. Uh, what are the solutions? Well, more international cooperation, more international dialogue on these matters. But we all know that in this world, it's not always uh, very easy. So I think here we have probably one of the uh, key challenge. Another a second challenge I see is uh, because, you know, all this money we are raising on the markets, uh, you have investors behind. Huh? Uh, so I think we, there is a, a very large push to be made on the investor side, when, I, when we compare Europe and Asia, uh, we could see that uh, we have more investors in Europe, which are keen uh, to buy all those green bonds and, and products, and we have less in Asia. We have some in Japan, but we have less in Asia. So for Asia to do its part, uh, we probably also need to see uh, uh, more development on the investor side in Asia. We are all working on it, but uh, I think some still a long way to go. Uh, I Just to put some numbers into that, uh, I think uh, uh, Europe is probably twice as much advanced in this respect as Asia. Uh, so there, there is a gap that there that uh, needs to be, uh, to be filled. Um, it was mentioned before, we also need uh, more uh, independent uh, people, uh, rating agencies uh, uh, to analyze and to uh, ensure that the KPIs we are producing and following would be uh, uh, properly computed uh, so that we have, we create an, an even field for all the issuers and all the borrowers. So here again, they are uh, they are progress. Huh? We are all aware of a number of uh, uh, rating agencies uh, specialized in this field. Uh, Standards and Poor's uh, bought uh, TrueCost not that long ago. S&P TrueCost, now we have a, a strong reference uh, agency for such matters. But I think more will come and it will probably also become more complex uh, going forward. Tracy was mentioning the evolution from uh, relatively simple products like green bonds or green loans, quite simple. Huh? You borrow money or you raise money and you are going to use this money to uh, build a, a wind farm uh, offshore uh, the coast of uh, Taiwan or offshore the coast of France. It's simple to understand. This is evolving now and we are moving to more complex products uh, which are uh, uh, what we call uh, general purpose financing, which means it's a company, it's an issuer who is going to borrow money uh, to do whatever they want to do, but by while doing this, they would commit uh, to reach certain KPI uh, going in, in, in the right direction. So it's becoming more complex and hence the need for uh, external uh, uh, providers uh, to check that what is being done is, is, is right. Yeah, very interesting. And since we are in a university, you realize how much is needed then in terms of education for all the, the young people that would be working in finance in the future, uh, because it's definitely very different. Michel, you were mentioning obviously Europe as being a very powerful uh, participant in this movement, and the numbers here are clearly, uh, I mean, showing that because in terms of issuance and everything. But Hong Kong is uh, also a very interesting place to be because it's an international financial center. It's an international financial center of China, which is one of the most important uh, issuers of CO2 with the carbon uh, neutrality uh, target by 2060 and all it means. And here I would like to ask Tracy to comment a bit on what she sees because clearly the Green Finance Association, if you just look at the number of participants 
today and um, uh, members of the association only that would make you feel very happy that there is actually quite a lot going on here but what else do we want to see in Hong Kong? Jason? Thank you, thank you. So I, I guess this is a very good question to bring it back closer to home in Hong Kong and before I go into 2021 I, oh, I want to give you a teaser of for the past two years how the regulatory space has set the scene and then um, then to share my view about going into 2021 for Hong Kong. So from so as I mentioned earlier, for the last two years, um, green and sustainable finance has grown rapidly in Hong Kong. And from rolling out the local green bond uh, incentive, including the green bond grant scheme that cover your certification fee, to the pilot bond program that cover your uh, give you a cash subsidy for um, uh, bond issuance to the first uh, one billion US dollar green bond issuance from the Hong Kong government that Michelle mentioned. Then from the Hong Kong Monetary Authority side has announced the three key green and sustainable finance measure, including green sustainable banking, responsible investment, and also setting up a center of green finance to provide technical support for the banking industry. Now from the stock exchange side, um, um, if you're listed in Hong Kong, you will know um, they have implemented mandatory ESG reporting for all listed companies in Hong Kong started this July, 1st of July. Now, from the SFC side, um, very e recently, they have issued a consultations paper on management and disclosure for climate-related risk for fund manager. Also, the establishment of the Green and Sustainable Finance Cross-Agency Steering Group with compliance of two government bodies, which Environmental Bureau of KS was here earlier, together with FSTB, and five regulators, MA, SFC, HKX, HKIA and the MPFA all together to better coordinate effort um, to establish an ecosystem for green standard, transparency, incentive, and product. And lastly, we also launched the Greater Bay Area Green Finance Alliance, which is a collaboration between the Hong Kong Green Finance Association, Guangzhou uh, Green Finance Committee, Shenzhen Green Finance Committee, and the Macau Bank of, uh, Association, creating a platform to host research and incubate green investment cross-border. Now, with this effort uh, across the Hong Kong government's regulators and private sector um, in the past two years, it positioned Hong Kong to be a leading green sustainable center. And I would say Hong Kong is ready for the next phase, which is the action mode, um, to further scale up the green sustainable finance in the region. For example, as I mentioned, the SFC consultations deadline is 1st of um, uh, 15 of January in 2021, so just round the corner. And I expect the change of regulation to come out very soon. What does it mean? It means it is imminent with the change of um, the fund managers' code of conduct to require fund managers to take climate-related risk into consideration in their investment, in their management, risk management process and disclosure. Also, the MA already issued the white paper. Uh, Hugo is not, not noting. Uh, he said uh, a lot of the bank exactly has been really working together with the monetary authority to driving the green um, and sustainable banking uh, piece. So I expect um, there's some um, hopefully actions coming out this year. Um, also, uh, we mentioned the Hong Kong government. They have already further announced this another 66 billion green bond issuance to coming out in the upcoming five years. And last and but not least, I want to address um, um, taxonomies has been highlighted by, by our speakers quite a few times. Um, I want to call out that um, last year at one of uh, the SFC meeting where we have the EU, we have um, actually TCFD secretariat in Hong Kong and together with China regulator, Hong Kong regulator. At that meeting, it was agreed to uh, set up a technical task force to harm for um, uh, taxon tax uh, green taxonomy harmonization between China and EU. And this technical task force has been formed now and they are putting into action and there are two phase of um, 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 how that works is going to be divided into two phase the first phase hopefully next year we will see the first crossover comparison between the china taxonomy and eu taxonomy this will form a really uh, good um, um, level ground for the first layer, and hopefully the um, the the crossover uh, majority, 80 90 percent, with the 10 percent to further analyze how to um, iron those out in the future. So I'll I'll stop here. Mm.
Thank you. Thank you. No, I was just saying, put the microphone next to you. It was, I didn't mean that you should stop because I kept listening to you. I thought you were also talking about, isn't a Carbon Connect coming up? Yes, I, I, will, I will actually talk. Oh, yes, sorry. That. Oh, gosh, sorry. I did a big mistake here. Don't, no worries. Okay, we'll talk about it later. Uh, Johannes, final word from you about the future and outlook for green finance in the coming uh -huh. years. How do you see it? Okay, well, I, I think I'm maybe be a little bit more downbeat in, in some way, because I think we also, we, we've talked about green finance, finance, we have up there ESG, so environmental, social governance, social and environmental, there, there are trade-offs. I mean, it's very clear, we, we saw earlier the graph, how much coal there will still be produced 30 years down the road. Coal is not just coal, coal is, is people working. I mean, this is, this is not trivial. At the same time here in Hong Kong and all over the world, we can see at the moment, Health is important, so a lot more plastic gets produced. Is that good for, for green? Obviously, it's not good, but it's good for health. So these trade-offs, I think we also need to, to bear in mind. Now, the English, there's a few English here, they have a lovely saying, horses for courses. You do need to differentiate. Yes, we do need a global carbon price, but we do also need to recognize that regions are different, countries are different. Europe can lead by example, but we will not change the world alone. People will need to make their own decisions and come to their own beliefs that the climate is something important that impacts us because the trade-offs sometimes are going to be unpleasant. It's not just we do refinance and then we're all very happy. It also means a lot of things that we become used to that, uh, that are important to us. So I think that's something where we need to take everyone along on that journey. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Indeed, there are different uh, challenges that they will all be related. So we will not talk probably soon about just climate finance, but again, it is actually sustainable finance, and then it will just be finance, which has to be sustainable. Great, we are coming close to the end of this uh, wonderful panel. Uh, and uh, to end on a, on, a, on a bit of a different note, I wanted to ask each and every one, uh, not saying that the Hong Kong University uh, of uh, Science and Technology and the Consulate General of France have to feel obliged to invite us again in five years' time. But of course, if you wish, uh, we will be very, I think we will all be, be very happy. Yeah? But no, but we start by fi in five years' time. We are here again. It's the 10th anniversary of the Paris Agreement. Uh, each and every one, uh, in a couple of words, what would you like to be able to say in five years' time? Start with you, Johannes. I think you just mentioned, I think in five years it would be good if we weren't talking about green finance so much any longer, because green finance would be the norm. And we might need to talk a little bit about brown finance because it would be the small bit and not the large bit. True. Thank you. Tracy? Thank you. So now I come to my two words, yeah, the I'm carbon so market. <laughs> so um, I would like to see a well-developed carbon market across the globe uh, by the time we celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Paris Agreement. So, so to develop the, um, a little bit more on the carbon market. So to develop the carbon market is one of the five key projects that under the Greater Bay Area Green Finance Alliance that we are working on. Um, with the goal to establish a standardized carbon marketplace for cross-border trading covering the Greater Bay Area. Um, to create a channel, we call it the Carbon Connect uh, channel, to allow global investor to enter China carbon market more conveniently via the Greater Bay Area. And Hong Kong's well-established financial infrastructure can serve as a trading um, center to enable that. So carbon market is my two carbon words. Carbon market, two words. Thank you, Hugo. Well, I was about to say carbon, but then since Tracy oh, mentioned yeah, that. These were not prepared, so, and they had so, to do it on their own. So for me, I think it's uh, alignment, um, and I will stick to my pre what I previously stated, impact measurement. I think that is very key for the further development going forward. Yeah, I, I'm going to be provocative. I tell you up front, I, I think the uh, COVID-19 should have shown already that it's not about the level of development for something that is global. What I'm trying to say here is that even if we want to find slower ways or easier ways, because we deserve it, because you know we, we came later. I mean, I can, it's just too important. We need to find another way. We need to find a way to then have that global <laughs> carbon price and perhaps find subsidies across countries, but we can't just delay it because of 
different development uh, stages. And not, not to be unfair, it's because there's no choice. And I think we are very close. COVID will help us understand this. It was there for everybody. Michelle? Well, you really is caring that it's always very difficult and challenging to be the last one to speak. But I know you're up to the challenge. Especially when you have a bunch of smart people before you and uh, they pick up the good ideas and you are left <laughs> with nothing. Um, uh, more seriously, uh, yeah, you know, 10 years ago, uh, no one would have ever thought to organize such a conference, such a panel. Five years ago, we were really at the uh, bottom of the mountain uh, and, and, and had Mount Everest to climb, so that was uh, probably a bit scary. So we are maybe not yet uh, half, we are not yet at camp base, but uh, we have made progress. So I think from uh, the answer I will give you is maybe from my own perspective. As a banker, I hope I could say then, as uh, my colleague said earlier, that uh, from non-existent to marginal, uh, the green and sustainable business has become mainstream for the banks. Mm. Thank you. Well, it's hard not to forget, uh, or it's hard to forget COVID, especially uh, when we all are behind a mask instead of uh, seeing our beautiful smiles. But as you all said, and it's actually uh, there are a number of similarities between uh, COVID-19 and, and the climate change. And that's what uh, a lot of people are saying, you know, treat, it, uh, treat climate change as it it is, it is a crisis and it is an emergency. So uh, we have uh, a lot of things to do and a lot of things to finance. And I hope uh, that um, I would like to say, first of all, thank you to my wonderful panelists uh, about, uh, for all your thoughts and all your perspectives and to uh, the audience here today at, um, at HKUST and to our online audience. I would also like to say that at least we hope that you have uh, come up with uh, or came with a conclusion that uh, finance is needed, but finance is ready. <laughs> so uh, there are uh, a lot of new products, there's a lot of innovation, there's a lot of money and a lot of ideas, and we will all need that to, uh, to reach the goal of the Paris Agreement. Uh, and on this, thank you so much. Uh, join me uh, with an applaud to our panelists, and thank you so much indeed. Just one, 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 one word to, 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 to thank you and uh, to say that I'm not so pessimistic and I'm more and more optimistic uh, listening to, to you. What uh, I understand, and this is uh, um, a reason to be optimistic, is that it's not only a matter for uh, governments, for states, for administrations, uh, even if, of course, uh, the Paris Agreement was signed by governments, but it, it has been signed by governments because there was behind a strong pressure from the opinions, from the citizens, from the NGOs, from the associations. And now the implementation cannot be done alone by governments. And what is very interesting here is that we have seen uh, companies in the infrastructure sectors uh, and banks saying, okay, we are the private sector, but we are ready. We will not let this to governments. We will, of course, we need the governments because we need, as uh, Secretary Wong explained, we need some schemes. We need, especially in uh, the fiscal uh, system, some schemes to be adapted. Okay, this is needed. But then, and this is the idea of what uh, we launched in 2017 with a new kind of uh, a new kind of summit. So it was two years after the, the Paris Agreement, one planet summit. Uh, one planet summit are summits which uh, are organized once a year. It was a, a, a French idea, and the idea is to have governments and companies having a special experience in, I would say, in green in green and i think this is this is the right approach this is the, the citizens with association ngos governments which are still needed and especially now the private sector and uh, for that we need something we need something 
we need the know-how, we need the knowledge, we need the experience. And that's why uh, the most important today is to uh, have the students, uh, the researchers, uh, go into this direction. We need more and more precise expertise. And that's why I'm very happy to that HKUST accept to do it here in, uh, on this beautiful campus. Because the most important now is to have students understand that green means future and means money and means jobs, not only sustainability, but means for an individual perspective. So I think this is uh, the, 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 the most important. So let's be op optimistic. Thank you very much again. And uh, I would like to currently close the uh, conference. And thank you very much again for all this uh, speaker with the wonderful insights, as well as the participants both here at HKUSD and uh, in the web. Thank you very much.